Hello everyone and a very good morning to all of you. We are uh, here today again for the third talk for this Wildlife Week talk series. And uh, today we have a very uh, interesting talk happening. It's all about bats and that's the topic for today's talk. And for today's uh, speaker is uh, Tariq Ahmed Shah. He is Senior Research Fellow at uh, Wildlife Biology and Taxonomy Lab, Department of Biology from Osmania University. Tariq has been involved in various ecological projects ranging from conducting baseline survey and assessment of conservation status of Himalayan langur under the Conservation Leadership Project to DNA barcoding of bats of Peninsular India, which was funded by DBT, uh, sorry, DST sub uh, project. He is currently um, working on molecular phylogeny of the bats of genus Rhinopo martidi in India. I think I pronounced it correctly. Yes. So without taking further of your time, I would request Tariq to please go ahead with your presentation. Please, Tariq. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Very good morning to all of you. So I think Mehreen has already spoken about me. So without wasting time, I will directly go to the my presentation. So can you switch to the presentation, Mehreen? Yes, please. I'm, yeah, sure. I'm shifting to your presentation. You can, yeah. Sure. yeah. OK. Yeah, you're on. OK. So as you know, the it's, uh, the wildlife week is happening, and then uh, I have chose bats because I am like uh, I am working on the bats. So I thought because bats were always misinterpreted, and uh, they were there people confuse them with the birds. So that's why I thought of taking bats. So I will be speaking about the bat biology. Okay, uh, okay, just one second. So is my presentation, it is in a uh, slideshow or it is just in, because on my screen it is showing half. You are not on slideshow right now, Tariq. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, I'll, okay. Okay. Thank you. So I'll be talking about the bat biology. So basically what are bats? So they are often mistaken as birds because so that's why i will start with the bats and the birds so what happens because when we do uh, while surveying a lot of places around uh, in different states so i came to know that there are a lot of people which misinterpret them as the birds so that's why i have i just made a first slide saying bats and birds so how they look similar but actually they are totally different so you can see the bats can fly as well as the birds can fly. But bats can fly, but they are not birds. They are mammals just like us humans. And they are the only mammals which are the capable of true and sustained flight. And they fly with their hands, not with their arms. So you can just see how a bat looks like. It's an illustration from the Bat Conservation International Activity Book. So here you can see how the bat looks like. You have this thumb, which represents the first finger, then second finger, third finger. We call them the digits, first digit, second digit, third, fourth, fifth. And similarly, we have a wing membrane, which makes, which enables them to fly. But going to the next slide. I'm not able to, okay, okay, yeah. So bats and birds. So the, there's a commonality among the two. Both can fly, but they are not closely related. You can see that th both are vertebrates, but they belong to the different mammals. Birds come from the aves. They belong to the class aves, whereas bats are a part of class mammalia. And birds, they rely on heavy vision. They have a good vision to navigate, to forage, and they are restricted to the periods of daylight. That's they are utilizing the daylight for the, all these activities. but in contrast, the bats, they use echolocation which, for navigation, for foraging. And so they are using the another part of the 24 hour cycle. They are, so they are nocturnal basically. So they are active at night. So both, both bats and birds, they are ecological equivalents, which mean to say 
see there are a lot of birds which feed on insects there are a lot of birds which feed feed on which feed uh, which which feed on fruits okay in the same manner bats also we have the mega bats we have the micro bats so the both these groups the mega bats feed on fruits micro bats and insects so they are using a common resource but they are using different parts of the 24 hour cycle day and night birds use the day and bats use night so birds have feathers by the bats they have fur like mammals and birds have the pneumatic bones which enables them to fly whereas bats have they have a lightweight version of the marrow filled bones so coming to the main topic what are bats so bats belong to the order chiroptera chiro chirop means hand and tera means wing so that's how the name came and they are further divided into two suborders mega chiroptera and micro chiroptera so mega chiroptera they are basically mega bats which are fruit eating like flying foxes tetrapods gigantes we say and the micro chiroptrans we have a diversity of micro chiroptrans so and they are known as micro bats and they eat insects and that's why they are called as insect eating bats so bats are the second largest order of mammals after the rodents so after rodents they represent almost 20% of the mammal species worldwide and we have i think 1400 bat species more than that and the numbers keeps on changing with the new new discoveries new species descriptions and all they live on all continents except antarctica and there are a lot of myths about the bats and like they suck blood they stick to the hair and they are a bad omen among the humans so people are like they are scared sometimes and they are these are they are hunted for their meat and presumed medicinal values so because uh, while we're surveying while while surveying through the peninsula in india and other parts of india so i used to speak i used to speak with the people around and they i used to say so what are your views about the bats and they use, the few people they used to say that they cure asthma but that's not true so with that thinking that they have a medicinal values people used to hunt them so so this is the part of uh, this is the another part so coming to their nocturnal behavior and volant habitats it makes a, them a less studied mammal so that's why because every, because all the people want to go to the forest they want to study the different mammals or different animals mostly people prefer the survey during the day but due to their nocturnal habitat so i think there is a lot of lot of people don't want to study in the uh, night time they want to do surveys in the day time so this nocturnal behavior and volant habitat this makes them as less studied mammal so coming to the mega bats so we have different kinds of mega bats which are fruit eating bats so you can see right in the picture we have the first one is uh, cynopterus sphinx and then another one is rosetus lesnolti and this is the tyropus which i think most of the people have seen which uh, they basically roost on the trees so about this order mega chiroptera so they are commonly known as fruit bats and they represent a single family tyropodidae so these are medium to large size bats and they primarily feed on the ripened fruits nectar pollen flowers and about their feeding and ecosystem services i will be talking later so this and just i am giving an uh, just to brief about this that they are medium to large size bats and they feed on the ripened fruits pollen flowers and they have large eyes they have small small and simple ear and they have a elongated muzzle like a dog dog shaped and they generally lack a tail so they lack the ability to echolocate so these bats they don't echolocate except one species the rosetus lesnolti i will show you the this one so this bat it 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 does the false echolocation so so otherwise all the bats they don't echolocate except the rosetus lesnolti but they have a good sight sense of smell and they have a rudimentary vision and they play an important role in the environment environment by helping in the forest regeneration and through the seed dispersal mechanism so coming to the micro bats you have the different kinds of micro bats here so you can see the first one is lyroderma lyra and this is the megaderma spasma so they both belong to the these two these two both they belong to the same family megadermatidae then you have horseshoe bats 
horseshoe bats are like rhinolophids and hypostrates so we have rhinolophids firmicinum so this photograph is from the kashmir and it has been taken from the bumzu cave again this is the hypostrates lanka diva and you have the myotis blithi again it's from the kashmir this photograph is taken from the kashmir and then we have the rhinolophus bidomi it's a this bat is basically it's known as uh, lesser woolly bat and you can uh, most of the times it's it's uh, uh, restricted to the western ghats so sub coming to the suborder microcharyptera they are known as insectivorous bats they feed on the variety of insects and but it has been seen other dietary habits have been also observed like there are some species which hunt birds lizards frogs smaller bats or even fishes so these this bat you can see the lyroderma lyra this one so it's a basically it feeds on smaller vertebrates like rats lizards frogs so their size varies from very small to large and have a small and they have small eyes ears and tragus and that's how they don't have a vision they, they they have very small eyes they but they have a special kind of communication system that's known as echolocation which helps them in navigation and foraging so they generally use the ultrasound via larynx larynx and they emit the sound through the nose or the open mouth and you know uh, the audible range for the human is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz but there are the microbats they so their vocals they are they echolocate beyond 20 kilohertz that's why we are not able to that's why we are not able to listen to those these bats but fruit bats you can listen to them because they are more audible and next they act as a natural pest control agent so they they help they feed on the agriculture pests and other disease carrying um, organisms carriers like mosquitoes they feed on mosquitoes bugs flies so as per uh, as per the present literature we have 143 species of microcharyptids in south asia so that was the old classification which was based on the old classification which was based on the classical taxonomy like morphology feeding habitat and all that all that thing but the new system of classification has come means it we have a new system of classification which is based which is based on the dna dna sequences that is genetic sequences so every one of us have his own dna barcode so all the species they have a signature barcodes of their own species so that's how on the basis of those modern genetic sequences the chiroptera has been divided into two suborders yinchirochiroptera and yangochiroptera so with the yinchirochiroptera we have the mega bats that's fruit bats along with them there is an addition of five insectivorous bat families so you can see here suborder yinchirochiroptera so you have the hypostridae megatomatidae rhinolophidae rhinopomatidae crassonectridae so all these families they come under now yinchirochiroptera and this is based on the molecular genetics data i think there are a few papers like teeling et al uh, and they have resolved this and they have generated the transcriptome data and that has been strongly supported and nowadays this system of classification is also followed and the yangochiroptera they are basically vespertilionids and they again again a suborder so which which include all those all these families except the five which are which have been shifted to the uh, yang uh, yinchiroptera so coming to the diversity of bats so bats based on the present information published the present data present literatures india has got almost 120 to 130 species of bats and south asia with 143 species so in the world there are about 400 1400 species of bats belong to 21 families and these numbers keeps on changing with the new exploration with new discoveries new species and descriptions and there has been very less study on the bats sub diversity of jammu kashmir see coming to the bats sub jammu kashmir they have hardly been studied previously the bats in jammu kashmir were studied by few scientists and then the chakraborty he reported 27 species in 1983 and later the bates and harrison came in 1997 and he has done a remarkable wonderful work on the bats of india and he has got a book uh, bates and harrison which uh which has almost descriptions of the all bats except a few 
and he reported 33 species from the state. And from last 23 years, the state of Jammu and Kashmir, you you, ha you have seen that we have witnessed a drastic change in its topography, demography, climate change. You see the railway projects coming in, tunneling up the huge mountains. And there has been a lot of change demographically. And and within from the last 23 years, there have been no reports of character and fauna published since. I don't know the people, uh, means there has been no studies after 1983. And but recently we have done some uh, surveys in in one of my districts, and I think uh, there's a lot of scope in doing uh, in doing the character study in the Jammu and Kashmir. And what I feel is because Jammu and Kashmir, the de demography is such we have the temperate region, we have the cold region, we have the hot region. Like Jammu division, it's a hot region, and then we have the cold area that's Kashmir. So I feel like we will be having a lot of diversity of bats from the Jammu and Kashmir, which needs to be explored. So coming to the, some important facts about the Kashmir. So this is uh, just want to know, uh, to tell you about this bat. It's known as a collar leaf nose bat, Hippocytus hypophilus. The name itself says collar leaf nose bat means it belongs to a collar. Collar is a place in, it's a place near Bangalore and it's, a, it's one of the villages in the uh, Karnataka. So this species of bats is not found elsewhere in the world except in, in the Kolar region of Karnataka. And it is endemic to Kolar. And we had, I think we had done a lot of outreach and awareness activities. So we have to, uh, we have to face a lot of problems because this roost, the, the, the bat was roosting in a cave, which was undermining. Just because when you go to the South India, you will find the huge boulder caves, very huge. And the people used to, the, the mining, people used to mine it. And I think in 2012 or 13, when we found this beautiful bat, so uh, so we observed that a lot of mining was happening. And there was one more roost which was abandoned. And most probably there might be one or two colonies, but they, are, they were gone because people, when they do mining, so obviously the habitat is going to lose. So we had to do a lot of awareness. We had to take, we, we visited forest department. We visited the people around. We, we involved with the local people, local politicians. And finally, finally, it has been now protected by the Karnataka forest department and the whole area has been taken into the, into the forest department means they have taken, uh, taken care of, uh, it was a basically the revenue land and then it has been converted into forest land and soon this area is going to be the one of the bad centuries in the in the coming times so this is how uh, this beautiful bat was saved so coming to the largest and the smallest bat so you can see the in the photograph you can see this is the bumblebee bat kitty's hawk nose bat and it weighs less than a penny and you can you can imagine holding it between the two fingers how small it is and on the side, you can see this lady, she's holding a bat and it is one of the biggest, uh, largest bat, golden, gained golden crown flying fox, Acridon jubatus. And it's an endangered species found in Philippines. And it, the wingspan is 1.5 meters, which means almost five to six meters and it's the largest bat. So you can see the range variations. So compared with the small mammals, so coming to the lifespan, so, uh, like we humans, the uh, the longevity is like 60 to 65 years, max 70. So similarly, these mammals, these small mammals, they they are long lived and the longevity is almost 20 to 30 years. It depends upon species to species, but they may live up to 30 years or more. And it depends upon the species, I am again telling you. But the maximum age, it varies from species to species and is influenced by the geography and lifestyle. So bats in the temperate zones, they spend most of the time in hibernation. Okay, and they live the longest. And uh, for example, the bat, little brown bat, Myotis lysifugus, it holds the record for 33 years, means uh, because the, the people have recorded that the longevity of this bat and it they have seen up to 33 years. And, fly, and flying foxes, they live, to, live up to 23 years in captivity and around 15 years in the wild. So coming to the roosting sites, why do these bats live? So you know that bats, fruit bats, they live on trees. So Tiropus 
roots and different kinds of trees and and few uh, mega bats obviously they live in the caves also like rosita it's a cave dwelling bat and other microcaryptids you can see so all over the india we have these monument sites we have the different monument sites that that are under the archaeological survey of india and then we have the huge mines which were during the british during the british period there were a lot of places where the mining was done for the uh, for its uh, means ore and all so those mines they are now abandoned so i came across a lot of caves and like a lot of abandoned mines around goa around gujarat and and as of now the bats roost there so because because they are totally undisturbed and coming to the monument sites so lot of because uh, like rajasthan gujarat they have a lot of monument sites they have forts they have temples of the historical importance uh, and the havelis and some dargahs also mosques also so all all these places they are the root they are the roost they are now the roosting sites and basically they have been, the bats have been reported from these uh, uh, time and back but as of now the roosts are there but the population has gone down due to the because they are now thrown to open to the tourists so these are different types of roost sites so mainly they like the dark places like the tunnels like mines like the cellars underground cellars etc so what do they eat so what do bats eat so i told you about the fruit eating bats they feed on the fruit like the one is holding a banana and the another one is feeding on the nectar another one is acting on a some kind of fruit and then you have insectivorous bats they feed on the insects like cockroach moths grasshoppers hemipterans coleopterans bugs beetles so coming to the reproduction the reproduction is similar to that of mammals and they give birth to a single young one per litter whereas in some few exceptional cases they can give birth to the twins micro bats undergo hibernation period during the colder months of the year and and they they will follow the different reproductive cycle in different parts of india so that will be different and mega bats like the mammals they they mark a two meter stretch of branch with a strong scent then the scent is attracted by the females courtship begins with the vocalizations vocalizations and all and they gestate in the after the mating they gestate about 25 to 28 weeks so by four weeks flying fox are left in the crutch with the other bats by 10th week they will start testing their wings by the 20th week they start foraging and the by two years the young ones become the mature so what do bats do in winter so obviously like in kashmir the winter is approaching so we we all people will like we will we will gather we will gather the different kinds of woolen clothes and we will prepare for a winter we will keep storage of food etc so similarly what do bats do in winter so in temperate zones bats are active only during the summer so when the insect population when the food source is high so they will be active but once the winter comes either they will migrate to the warm climes like birds or they will hibernate in the caves so th the body the body processes the metabolic the metabolism it will it will be it will be slow drastically and the energy consumption it is minimized because they won't be moving anywhere and the virus in tropical regions the bats are actively throughout the year because i have seen that in in the in the states like the uh, tamil nadu telangana in the southern part it's almost uh, it's it's almost uh, uh, means good throughout the year there's there's not that much of cold ha huh? i but in the colder parts like rajasthan they have they have a little bit of cold during the winter winter months so but the bats are active throughout the year but in some states they are they are in the torpid stage but not that much but in the temperate zones they are completely undergo undergo hibernation so in some species the bats what happens they will store the reserves of fat because uh, once i was serving to the rajasthan and it was uh, uh, i have seen bat roosts with a large fat reserves near the abdomen and thighs and that's how they utilize that in winter 
So some myths about the bats. So do bats fly into the people's hair? No, they don't. Exactly, they don't. There has been no evidence till now that they will poke into your hair. And this belief just came out because of the behavior of the bats in flight. Because when the when the bat comes out of its roosting site, it may explore the pathways. It may explore. It may go around the circles for the foraging and eating the insects. And you might have a mosquito somewhere sitting here, and the bat will come and try to eat it or something. And then you will you will feel like that. Okay, I think it's going inside my hair or something. But that's not the case. That it is just they have behavior, and that's how they are interpreted. And then coming to the Duke bats carry disease. See the they don't carry disease. They they have the host to the virus, various viruses like the bats can carry is rabies. But similar is the case to other mammals also. All the mammals they do carry rabies. It depends. So till today, there has been hardly any case of rabies caused by bats, except few cases in America. But that only because the bat might have come in contact with the human. Otherwise, there is no possibility. So, similarly, when there was a rabies outbreak, the strain of the virus that has been traced back, it was been traced back to dogs, cats, raccoons, skunks, and other mammals also, because you you can you can imagine because the bat cannot bite you, but there are chances that a dog can bite you. So, so the, even the dog may have a virus, but there is a minimum chance of bat coming close to the human rather than a dog. So why do bats like buildings? So several species of bats have taken to buildings as they own their places. And the reason is due to the habitat loss, urbanization, deforestation. So, so now the bats have shifted their roots to main buildings because they are temperature stable. They take refuge from the predators because bats have predators. Like there are some birds like shikra, they feed on bats once they come out. And so, so they need, so during the daytime, they have to be inside some dark places and when while exploring they will find the old buildings as a refuge so what so what should be done if a bat gets in my house because i have been uh, i mean number of times my friends or somebody will call me uh, that we have got a bat inside house what to do it's going to bite or something like that but uh, just for information i want to tell you nothing is going to happen so in case in case if a bat gets inside your house there is a possibility because in evening if the windows or doors are open, so it may just it may just go in come into your room while foraging for an insect or something like that. So as usual, we will get confused. The people get confused what to do. They will get scared over oh, bats coming because they haven't seen something like bat before. So, like if we are confused, we are upset. Similarly, the bat itself gets confused and upset. And it tries to go around making circles. So there is no need to panic. And the best thing is open your all windows, doors which are leading to outside, not inside. And let him find its way and it will go away. But in case it settles down, there are, there are uh, sometimes the bat will come and it will settle down near your AC or somewhere where you have some space. So the best thing is take a towel gently put on it without hurting it and carry it outside and release it that's the only best way rather than killing or something because it's not going to harm you okay 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 so hanging upside down so this is the most interesting like bats they hang upside down so why do they hang upside down and how does it happen because it's actually it's energy efficient and like birds birds fly bats fly but there's a difference between the wings of birds and bats so bats have a weaker wings than the than the birds so bats when the bird fly it can gain a momentum it is sitting it is perching on somewhere it gains momentum and can fly but bats can't do like that so they have within the time they have evolved and that's how that's the one reason that they are hanging upside down because 
when they are leave when they are upside down they release themselves from their roosting site or wall or somewhere and it gives them a momentum to fly and that's how it, uh, that's how they fly so and with this they don't need any energy so when a bird sits on a branch their tendons actually lock their toes with the tighter grip and it happens automatically have you seen a bird falling from a tree rarely because when they hold they have that uh, kind of locking mechanism within their toes and they will they will find a uh, trick or something they will perch on it and it, it gets automatically locked and that's how they don't fall similarly bats have also unique physiological adaptations <clears throat> that lets them hang around this way and they don't have to spend any energy for hanging upside down you can just imagine me hanging upside down how will i feel okay but if we see so no energy is we don't spend any energy while hanging upside down so similarly bats have this have got this adaptation their bones and tendons are set in a completely different way so their knees they are they faced backwards and they have a special tendons that lock their toes in a place and they allow them to hang freely while relaxed their tendons will actually pull their toes close just like a bird does but it from the opposite direction so basically bat doesn't need to spend energy while hanging upside down but they spend energy when they want to release themselves so it's like opposite to for flying they need to release themselves at that time they need energy since the talons remain closed when the bat is relaxed the uh, so you might come across the bat roost uh, suppose there is some dead bat i will show you the photographs of the live bat and the dead bat both are in the same posture they are hanging upside down even the dead bat it's not going to move it is not going to uh, get on the ground until and unless you poke it and it will fall down i will show you in the next next slide so this is the this is how the this is the mechanism uh, within the claws and toes and the secret is they don't use muscles at all they use tendons they have a specialized mechanism within the tendons and how it happens is like tendons connect connects muscles to bone but band in bats it is different <coughs> in bats these ten tendons connect their legs to the feet to the upper body and are pulled tight when the bat hangs on so these tendons are surrounded by the tendon sheath that slides everything nicely but inside the tendon sheath you can you can see these structures these saw like teeth so on the one side it has a saw like teeth and on another side we have the ribbing pattern which is basically it it fits into it where it holds something so when bat hangs on somewhere both these structures they come together they come together so just like the ratchet crank and shaft and it holds the feet and that's how they get locked it's a kind of passive digital lock so no energy is spent at all and that's how they can remain for hours <clears throat> so you can see this is a mouse tail bat so you can see this bat it's hanging upside down all right and then this bat it's a dead bat it's again ha hanging upside down so we must uh, so if 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 somebody is should everybody thinks that oh it's a dead bat why it is hanging like this so the reason is the mechanism of these tendons so they are locked they don't use any energy because it's a passive thing and it might have died of some disease or something and it is still there so you can imagine the how the mechanism works so coming to the communication communication is a very important part of these bats so flying foxes they use sound as a means of communication except uh, one rosetus and their hearing is similar to humans they make the calls clearly which are audible if you have come across the fruit bat roost you can <clears throat> you can listen their voices they keep on they keep on calling calling and especially uh, like tyropus and cynotherus sphinx they are very loud 
So a lot of noise you can see mainly at the dawn or dusk when, or, or when they are mating or when they are foraging on a tree. So you can hear, literally you can see them barking like dogs. So coming to the microbats. So microbats have again a sophisticated uh, phenomena, sophisticated uh, this uh, kind of phenomena in them and that's echolocation. So they don't rely on sight to find the food. Instead, they use ultrasonic sounds to produce echoes. It's just like the how the radar works. So similar kind of mechanism is in bats. And I think bats are evolved in more radar came later. So this is how how they are how they work. So micro bats they echolocate by bouncing sound waves off the objects and listen to their echoes. So these micro bats they echolocate, they will produce ultrasonic sounds. From the from their mouth or larynx, and and they will shoot to an insect or the prey, and the sounds will bounce back. So it's a kind of Doppler shift. It will bounce back, and the bat will be able to find. So what kind of prey it is? What is the size? What is the texture? That's how they emit the pulses of sounds at a frequencies which are inaudible to humans. I told you that. The audible range for the humans is 20 to 20 kilohertz. And beyond that, we are, won't be able to listen. We won't be able to listen. So bats, micro bats, they call uh, beyond 20 kilohertz. So there are bats which call at 30, 32, 52, 80, some 120 also, 150 also. So these sound waves are created in the bat's voice box and are emitted from the mouth or the nostrils. The echo that comes back to the bat can tell it how far away the object is and what is the size, what is the texture, or if it is a moving or it is a stationary. <clears throat> so these micro bats, they are mainly dependent on their echolocation to find insects while flying quickly through the air. And they are very, very much efficient in that. That's how they are great controller of the insects. And these bats should be in, actually encouraged in both the ecosystems, urban and this one. So this is how bats avoid objects and detect their prey using echolocation. You can see the bat, the sound waves are emitted by the bat and they are bounced back in the form of echoes and they emit the short frequency pulses up from their mouth or nose and the information is gathered from echoes and they construct a picture of, construct a sound picture of the environment. And I told you that they can differentiate between the surface forms and textures. So for these, we, for listening these voices, beautiful voices, we have a different range of bad detectors. We have the high-end bad detectors and we have the normal bad detectors also. So it depends upon again the money. So how much you effort, you can you can have the number of bad detectors. So you have Peterson D500, you have D1000 also. Then we have the Songmeter 4 and Songmeter 3. Like Songmeter 3, uh, SM4 is high-end of Songmeter 3 because it's like more portable. And this one is song meter three is a little bit, it's a little bit heavy. And then you have the M500, it is just like the USB. And you can just move around, you can connect it to the phone and you can you can go around for the acoustic surveys and you can find out what kind of bats are there. And that's how the bat call libraries are coming up. In India, there are hardly any work on the echolocation. So like our lab, they are starting and there are few people who are doing it, but I think uh, very less studies, very less acoustic studies. So this is the Peterson T2.340. It is just like uh, it's a heterodyne. It's a kind of transistor like you keep on tuning and at one at like 56 or 47, you will find the bat making calls and then you have to record it. But in other kinds, it's they are automatically recorded. They are broad spectrum detectors. So. <clears throat> These micro bats, they produce calls with a specific range of wavelength and uh, every species have a specific signature call and I will show you how the calls and the call characters different. So their recordings can go a long way to confirm the identification of species. So basically when we species, when we identify a bat, we look for the morphometry, we look for the cranial, cranial dental structures. We go for the baculum study. I will tell you about that in the later. And one of the most important thing is the acoustics. Acoustics that is bad calls. 
factors. So they, they are species specific. And that's why there has been a shift in approach towards the study of bats from invasive to non-invasive techniques. So this is one of the non-invasive techniques. Okay. And like, like we do the DNA studies, we take a wing pipe. That's again a non-invasive technique means because we don't take the whole bat specimen. We don't take a whole watcher specimen. Previously, people used to collect specimens and all. Now, all these things, they have been, it has been narrowed down and and we, we do a kind of non-invasive surveys like going for the acoustic surveys and which are very useful for the species identification, diversity distribution and the habitat preference, what habitat they are using. And these are the studies and there are, I think, more studies about this. And I just mentioned the few. So again, the same thing, they help in for orientation, foraging, navigation and communication between the members and the call characteristics of different species are specific, species specific. So this is how the echolocation call looks like. The first one, you can see the call shapes. You have two types of call shapes, like it's a frequency modulated and the constant frequency. This is in the, the these are actually they are the they are from the software and they're taken from the book. And you can see the sonogram and this is the oscillogram and this is the power spectrum. I'm going to show all of these in the in a live call. I have a recorded call and I will show you how it works. So this this is one of the calls from the Rhinolophus bidomi. I was telling you it is uh, mostly found in the Western Western Ghats. So you can just see. <coughs> <clears throat> okay, I think I should stop it here and I will just show you the different. So these are different species, like, like it's a Hipposidrus gallaritus. It belongs to the family Hipposidridae. Okay, you can see the calls. The call structure is totally different. It's a frequency modulated call and it calls at somewhere. This is 100, 10, 20, 120 to 123, right? And then you have Pipistrella It's a common Pipistrella. You will be... Uh, it's it's common everywhere and you can find it anywhere so it calls somewhere you can see it's like a hockey stick and it's something like 10 20 30 so like 35 up to 40 something like that 32 and then we have the rhinolophus lipids it's a horseshoe bat belonging it belongs to family rhinolophidae and it calls somewhere so it's five so somewhere in between 103 104 so it's plus minus, something like that. Then you have Rhinopoma hardwicki, which is a mouse tail bat. And you can see this type of call, it has a number of harmonics. And these are known as multi-harmonic calls. So there are a few bats which produce multi-harmonic calls. And in these calls, we will take the, the most dominant one. And you can, you can see the most dominant call is the second, second harmonic. So Usually we take the second harmonics for this species. And similarly, we have the emeronerids, so, and megadermatids where the second dominant harmonic is taken for the measurement. So this is one of the papers, and this is the representatives of the different calls of the equilocations from the, actually from the bats of the Gujarat. So in some districts we have surveyed, and then we, thought of publishing a paper and that's how it came up. <coughs> so these are different species with different call structures. So Marin, can you shift to, I want to show them the call, how it is analyzed now. Marin, yes. Yes, Dr. Yes, Marin. Yes. Uh, okay. okay. So is it is it visible? Yes, it, your okay. screen is visible. Okay, okay. So this is the kind of a software. It's known as we have a lot of softwares, but we use the bat sound, and this is how the calls work. So you have to go for the so whatever the call recordings you have taken. I mean, so suppose I will take this 
Rhino Lopez Bitomi call, which I have shown you. I will open it up. Okay. So this is the call. So you can see the how call looks like. And if you want to see the, this is the oscillogram. And if you want to see at what it calls, we have to go to the power spectrum. And then you can see it calls at 42.1 kilohertz. It calls at 42.1 kilohertz. So if I need to play this call, okay, I will play it to the one fourth. So this is how. Okay, so this is one of the species. If I take another species like Galeritas, you can see. So you can see these calls. So if I am, want to analyze them, I want to see at what there is something wrong with this. I can leave it. I just will play it. So different calls, <clears throat> they have different call structures. So this is how this software works. And so I'm going back to my presentation. So now coming to the bats and their ecosystem services, which is an important important aspect because when we think of conserving some species so we need some solid reason why we are going to conserve because most of the times when we go for the bad surveys we ask for the permission from the forest department and they, again they will be asking so why what are you doing with the bats why do you need to uh, do surveys and then we need to sit and we we tr try to make them understand because it's obvious nobody everybody has his own field own domain so nobody knows each and everything. So that's that's how we need to understand how bats are important for the ecosystem. And we know that each and every organism has its role to play in the ecosystem. And that's how this case of conservation stands up for the bats. And you have seen, uh, so till now, uh, till now you might have understood now the answer to this question, why and how, why should we conserve bats? So I will be going brief with the each and each one of that. So bats basically they act as a bio indicators of biodiversity. They helps in the pollination. They helps as a pest controllers. They help us in seed dispersal and uh, regeneration. So going to the next slide. So bats as a pollinators. So you know that birds also help in pollination and pollination by birds and other organisms like lungus also help in uh, pollination of fruits and all. So coming to the bats as a pollinator, so the bats play an important role in the ecosystem. So there are almost 500 plant species, more than that, which are dependent on bats to pollinate their flowers. So all the fruits which we enjoy, like Avocado, mango, banana, fig, peaches, jackfruit, guava, cashew nuts, spices, and many more. They all are <coughs> pollinated by these bats. So there are a number of plants with the specialized flowers to attract and accommodate bats. So because there are some plants which rely on bats for the pollination, and bats also rely 
vice versa on the food and fruit so there are number of plants they have a specialized flowers to attract and accommodate them in the night so some flowers are large they are bell shaped in order to accommodate the bat to reach the nectar at the bottom and vice versa there are for example we have the tube lipped nectar bat apicoda and banana bat they have extraordinary long tongues they have the the length of the tongue is almost half one and a half times the length of its body and how they and that's how they take the nectar out of it and they help in the pollination and similarly they both they both are interdependent on each other and that's how they act as the pollinators so coming to the biological pest control so maximum maximum means all microbats they feed on the insect pests of the crops and they act as a natural method of bio control the pest management and at the same time they feed on the mosquitoes and other disease causing insects so so you can see how beneficial they are to the to the humans and there has been studies which show that they eat more than the 70% of their body weight in the in the insects per night so according to the studies by the bat conservation international a single little brown bat can eat up to 1000 mosquito sized insects in a single hour so you can imagine how they play a role in reducing the spread of malaria which is a dreaded disease and they are these since these microbats they are blessing to the farmers as well as to the humans because they, they their efforts are worth praising they are a boon to the farmers and the people who are having orchards they feed on the insects with, with the varying sizes from 1 to 50 mm long based on the species of the bat the prey items include they feed on the arachnida coleoptera diptera hemiptera homoptera hymenoptera isoptera so different orders of the insects so and that's a basically different study if you if you do the fecal analysis if you do the fecal analysis of a roost site you go to the roost you just take a white sheet of polythene or something spread it bats will poop and morning you just spread it evening you just take the fecal matter and in the lab and if you if you do the analysis in the microscope it spread about uh, those in you will find the insect parts and you will come to know the what are the feeding habitat of the bat as well as you can find the what are the pests they are feeding on and there's a one case study i will tell you about the bracken cave in texas it is one of the largest known bat roost in the world over 20 million bats are there okay and they primarily feed on corn earworm and cotton bollworm moths which are the agriculture pest species and they cause a billion dollar damage to crops every year as it is reported by the bci so these mexican free tail bats they feed an estimated 1 million kilogram of the most costly agriculture pest insects each night so you can just you can just make a calculation one bat eats 20 female corn earworm moths in a night okay and each female it can lay 500 eggs so if you multiply these numbers so these 20 females are they have a potential of producing 10000 crop damaging caterpillars so you can see one bat helps in such a way so production of at least one third of the world's food including 87 of 113 leading food crops depends on pollination carried out by the insect bats and birds and it has it, it has been taken from the iucn the iucn says that they are very helpful i think the maximum of the pollination whatever we food eat fruits we eat they are due to these bats insects and birds and bats are the part of it also <clears throat> now coming to the seed dispersal and forest regeneration <clears throat> so the fruit bats they eat fruits they will take the food they will eat the pulp and they will throw the seeds out right and some some bats they will ingest the seeds within them and while the flight they will they will disperse them so that's how they help in the seed dispersal so they migrate as you know that the 
fruit bats they migrate for a longer distance in search of food so basically fruit bats they will migrate in the evening they will leave the roost and they will migrate uh, to the food source and they will come back in the morning and while coming back going they will defecate they will spit out these seeds during the flight and thou thus how they are carry, this is how they are dispersing seeds and help in the forest regeneration <clears throat> and then coming to the bioindicators so bats have been qualified as the best ecological indicators bioindicators both the disturbance and the existence of contaminants and i will tell you how see they account for the one third of the mammal species all right they are using both rural as well as the urban ecosystems so bats being a top predator on insects they can tell us about the health of the ecosystem and change in the land use practices because the availability of insects may reflect that more of the pesticide had been used so that means more of contamination all right similarly similarly the same pressure may be applied to any other wildlife and we can make in the ecosystem health so insectivorous bats they occupy the higher tropic level they are high, they are sensitive to accumulations of pesticides and other toxins and change in their abundance and change in their abundance may reflect the change in the populations of the orthopod prey species that's what i was telling and and you can link them with the disease so high fatalities if there are high fatalities in bats it can be associated with disease and may provide an early warning for the environmental and health people about the contamination and disease prevalence and mortality so that's why it is necessary to keep check on all the wild animals looking for looking for their behavioral change looking looking for looking that instead they should be checked for all the disease so that uh, so that because uh, there are lot of things which are associated with the wildlife all the zoonoses and zoonotic diseases so next bat guano as a fertilizer so it's it's one of the richest source of fertilizer they play an important role in soil fertility and nutrient distribution due to their mobility and use of different habitats so guano from bats is used as a fertilizer on agriculture crops because they have the high concentrations of nitrogen and phosphorus and it's, con it's considered as one of the finest fertilizer the mexican free tailed bat guano is extracted for fertilizer in thousands of tons from the cave i was speaking about in the texas and it it costs 2.86 to 12.10 dollars per kilogram and in india i have seen there were lot of roosts where the people on the sustainable basis in some villages of india they used to go to the caves they used to clean and take all the fecal matter and use them in the farms in the home gardens in the kitchens in kitchen gardens and all because i have seen them number of people i have interviewed they said yeah it's a good source of uh, uh, fertilizer and they do it on a sustainable basis because sometimes the roost will migrate to another place they will go and clean each and everything and then will use <clears throat> so this is a photograph it is showing how we capture the bats uh, it's not like we capture all the bats and all with the permissions for these we need to have the permissions to catch a bat there should be a license from the forestry department from the biodiversity boards and it is basically for the only the research purposes and this is the gear which we commonly use and uh, before handling and the gloves is an important thing because you, you shouldn't uh, you should wear a gloves while handling a bat and these are different equipments like vernier caliper and other stuff and this is one of the one another important thing harp trap so harp trap it is made up of harpoons and you can see those thin wires so basically harp traps are very good as compared to mist nets because if a bat gets into mist net we have to release it i mean it's very difficult if because what once it is in the net if we miss it by a minute so it will get entangled and the, the, the and the final thing is we have to cut that we have to destroy the whole net and we have to release him but half trap is like they don't get injured they will just go you can see there it they just strike these 
parts and they will go inside the bag and they will get collected there and they are not they, they won't be injured and they can be easily released without the injury so coming to the classical taxonomy part so this is what we do like uh, the external measurements they play an important role in identifying bats up to species level and we and for this we follow the different uh, publications by Bates, Harrison, and the Srinu Maslow et al. 2010. It's a very beautiful key, which was, which was, uh, which, which was published in 2010, and it's used worldwide. And these are the measurements which you usually take: the forearm length, ear length, tail length, and all these measurements. So craniodental measurements. Then, what happens if we have the overlap of external measurements suppose we are having a two bats with the same kind of measurements there but suppose they look similar there i found certain differences in their horseshoe or something but when i go for the morphometric they look similar so next thing is we have to rely on the craniodental measurements then we have to scull it out and then we do the all kind of craniodental measurements then we study the dentition also and this is how the bat skulls are photographed. These are the different aspects like dorsal, ventral, lateral. So all the aspects of the both upper and lower jaw. And coming to the bacillus studies, it's also one of the important study regarding bats. And it's again a species specific. <clears throat> so what the penis of the, the penis of the male bat contains a supporting bone called a baculum. And in fact, rodents also have a baculum. Uh, rodents, bats, they have a supporting bone called a baculum, the structure and the shape of which plays an important role in the classical taxonomy to identify it to at a species level. And suppose if, the, if there's a confusion arising with the overlapping characters, both morphometrics as well as craniodenta, then the next thing is we have to do the bacular study. Is the baculum similar or it is different? So baculum of the male watcher specimen is extracted following topal and it's photographed from different aspects, dorsal, lateral, and ventral, and then can be stored in a crystal for the long term. And, and these baculums, every species has its own baculum. And recently we have published a paper about the bacula of bats of India. Recently, I think in the last last two, two months back, and in which we have described all the baculas till now, almost 40 to 50 species. Uh, with the different bacula. <clears throat> so coming to the threats to the bat population. So habitat loss, injurious use of pesticides, insecticides, reach the decline of insects. And obviously they are going to, bats are going to dependent on the food source. So when we use most of the insecticides, pesticides, the food source for them is gone. And that's how it leads to their habitat loss. And even the climate change, if the climate change affects their life cycle of the, even if, the, if it changes, if it alters the life cycle of the insects, again, the insect population will go and bats will go up. And then is the building and the construction work. So there are a lot of construction and buildings going on. Like in JNK itself, we are, we are tunneling each and every mountain, which are the potential habitats of bat roofs. But who cares? So that's how the destruction of these roosting sites comes up. So bats being nocturnal, they don't like the light source. So artificial lighting of the root sites, access points, foraging pathways can disturb bats, which I have seen in the number of caves and the number of monument sites. Because what happens, all the monument sites, the archaeological sites, with the Archaeological Survey of India, the, because each and every fort is well lightened up. And in fact, the bats are also there. And what I have seen is the bats have shifted to the more darker places. But finally, they have lost their roost site because for the greed of the tourism, they don't care. And in fact, they spray the insecticides and all to get them off away from the <clears throat> these forts. The next is wind turbine. So now, because you know the wind energy is a, a renewable source of energy, and now it's 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 uh, uh, it's it's going up, and wind farms are there in the southern India. If you will go around the southern India, other places we have the large wind farms. Even that has also affected the bat diversity 
because when the bats come out of their roost for the foraging and all so there are chances of head on college collision and barrel traumas barrel traumas means damage due to the pressures change around the turbines so there are a lot of killings by bats these by these turbines and there are a couple myths and superstitions that people that that people kill them sometimes and then renovation of the monuments like forts temples i was telling all the forts all the temples all the monument sites which are with the archaeological survey of india previously the records say there were hundreds and thousands of bats but now if you will go they are just in double digits you will find 10 12 except few places where the roost was were good but otherwise there are even a lot of species which were reported from these places they are no more there and one more thing is illegal mining so illegal mining has led to the destruction of the roosting sites and that's how it's a threat to the bat population <clears throat> and next is no firm laws unfortunately that fruit bats in india they are put under the schedule fifth as a vermin category so so bats are like they are uh, they are least cared except there are few bats like rotten's free tail bat autumn rotini and salimali fruit bat lighted and salimali so these are the only two species which are scheduled under schedule one which are protected under schedule one of the wildlife autumn of rotten rotini is somewhere in karnataka uh, there are some caves called barapedi caves so they was there and some salimali fruit bat it is from it was recorded from madurai basically if you will listen to this how this uh, salimali fruit bat was discovered basically it was in a museum and the curator of the museum the scientists who are studying bats somebody has identified it as a sinutra sphinx and once some gentleman came and say oh it is not sinutra sphinx and then they discovered this species so it was a misidentified specimen and and now uh, you can see these bats they are uh, in madurai and i think northeast or somewhere they have reported this bat again while as if we compare in uk the bat species and the roosting sites they are protected legally under the wildlife and the countryside act and conservation of habitats and species regulation if a bat roost is inside your house you can't if you want to build a house you you can't do that because they are protected you have to inform the department and they will find a way out what should be done but you are not going to build another house by destroying their house rather than in india because i came across <clears throat> once i was surveying in rajasthan and there was one person who was so uh, in somewhere in gujarat he was uh, he was a merchant basically and he was he had an old uh, shop where there were bats and what he has done he has killed all the bats for re reconstruction reconstruction of the house that shop so similarly in malaysia these bats are protect, protected under the wildlife protection ordinance so who should think of more firm laws the people the people in the wild that they should come together because like in case of the kolar leaf nose bat so it is also critically in, it's it's an endangered species and like the place was under mining so i think we had a fought a lot lot with the forest department and the other people not not like literally fighting means we had to struggle a lot to get that bat uh, bat protected by the karnataka forest Depart department and the paul Racy is the co-chair with the bat specialist group and he says that classification of species as a vermin will make it extinct so coming to the bats and disease <coughs> which is also one of the important topic i wanted to take not because i am not a uh, virologist or some kind of who is working with the disease and all but just want to throw some light on it it's true that bats do host viruses that can affect human health right and the reason for the transmission to humans it is due to the habitat loss so nobody see, unless and until you come into contact with the bat there is nothing is going to happen okay once you destroy their habitat and then obviously they are going to come close and there are people there uh, i have there there are a lot of people i have means in the in northeast somewhere there is a bat festival the and the bat and you it's used as a bush meat consumption so things are going to happen then it's believed that flight in bats has resulted into strong immune system because what happens the immune system 
uh, bats has evolved a lot. So the daily flight in bats, due to the flight, the metabolism is increased and the body tem temperature of the bats, it is similar to the rate of fever. And that's how these viruses and bats coexist with each other. So the both have coexisted from the ages and they're still coexisting and they're evolving. So, and that's why they don't get disease. So bad droppings can sometimes cause allergic reactions of gastrointestinal problem or something if the dust is inhaled, whereas bad urine does not have any impact on human health. Because I have seen people saying, okay, uh, in Kashmir especially, they say that it will urinate on your eyes and your eyesight will go. So actually one of my neighbor, I was just looking for the bats. I was just going around over to saying, what are you doing? I said, I was like looking for the bats. He said, no, 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 don't go. It has been proven that urine has done something like that. Then I I tried to make him understand, but it was like, he said, no, no, it's not possible. So, but nobody has proved this because urine is urine of these bats. It's highly acidic. It's highly acidic. It is acidic to that content that it can corrode the metals and all, but it doesn't have an impact on the human health. So bats do not transmit disease. They are just host and for the transmission, a carrier is needed. <clears throat> and that's how <clears throat> I'm, I'll speak about a few lines about the bats and COVID-19. At present, COVID-19 is having a huge impact on all the sectors of society, like People have faced a loss at the individual level, family level, societies, and the economy. So a lot of things have happened. That's fine. But what happened in the meantime, without getting any scientific evidence, bats were blamed. I don't know for what, what reason they were blamed for the pandemic by some media sources. And I don't know the media in India, how they cover it which lead to the big misunderstanding and confusion. So a lot of confusion was, so there was a time when the people were in reports coming at that, okay, in that place they have killed bats and they're asking for the removal of bats. They are, they are, they are protesting with the government that these bats should go, they should kill them. But <clears throat> scientifically, there has been no evidence saying that COVID-19 originated in bats. They were just blamed for a reason because the virus found in one of the insectivore bats, it's a horseshoe bat in China. It's a close relative of that SARS-CoV-2 and the virus that the virus that caused COVID-19. But it is a close relative. It is not the same virus. Bats keep on mutating. So recent study has shown that RTG-13 and SARS-CoV-2 diverged 40 to 7 years ago from each other. They are totally do different things. And sometimes they were saying it's a chimera of the pangolin and bats. So a lot of things were coming out. But even the study conducted by the ICMR on the discovery of bat coronaviruses in two species of South Asian bats say that viruses found in the study are different from SARS-CoV-2 and cannot cause COVID-19. So people just read the title without reading the paper. They start blaming bats. Oh, this is causing corona. So I just request all the people that uh, unless and until something solid comes out so we shouldn't blame because when we blame the people are going to uh, do any kind of chaos <clears throat> so thank you very much so this is uh, just i want to know about my team bad team which is headed by the dr chelmala Srinivasu. he's the head of the wildlife biology lab and he's the director of the center for biodiversity studies we have a recently we uh, we have got a Center for Biodiversity Conservation Studies from the government of India, and it's, uh, it, it has come up. So uh, I think people who are interested to do work on bats can can uh, join the lab. And then these are the other members like Bhargavi Srinivas, she is a woman scientist, and then Harshwar Pritko, she is a postdoctor fellow. She has worked on the hypocytids. So myself, I'm again working on the rhinopomids, and then Devinder, he's working on the ecolocation. And Ajitya Srinivasu is an independent researcher and he works on a number of things and bioinformatics. He is a very good person with a, he has a lot of knowledge about the bioinformatics tools as well as the taxonomy. So this is our team and there's some photographs from the field. And these are the photographs which uh, we have done the outreach in the Kolar. You can see uh, Dr. Barker with the poster and this. 
with this saving this and protecting this bat. And uh, this is the last slide saying about the key to the bats of Mamelia. This is the key, and it's uh, it's online. It's free. It's open access. You can download it. Somebody who wants to start with the bats, so two books he should have with you. That's the key to the bats of mammals, and then another one is by the bats of Indian subcontinent by Bates and Harrison. They both are like Bible Bible of bats of India. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks for listening me. Thank you, Tarek, for this very informative, and uh, I'm sure a lot of myths have been busted already. It was a, a very lengthy and a very informative, very detailed presentation by you, and thank you so much for this uh, wonderful talk. Thank you, Mary. I I have a um, few uh, questions before I take yeah. the questions from the viewers. So I was just curious to know, have bats been used in illegal uh, trade or in some traditional medicine in India or in Kashmir? No, in Kashmir, I haven't, I haven't uh, recorded or heard of. But yeah, there means a lot of people, I told you, they have a myths. In I surveyed some areas where they say the bats treat asthma, they will take some gland out of it and they will make a medicine out of those, uh, uh, the old... I mean, those who care, there are like, like old people, they have a myth kind of thing. And then illegal trade is like there is, there are in, I think in some country I have seen some, I don't remember, there's a illegal trade with the, the bats. I mean, they kept them as a trophies, but I think it is banned now, but there are places where people, people do these kind of things, but scientifically, there is there is nothing like that that bats are used for the medicines means they can cure any disease except there is one bat is the vampire bat okay and what vampire bat do we don't have a vampire bat here we have a false vampires here like lyroderma lyra it's a vampire bat it's a false vampire it's not true vampire it doesn't feed on blood so but a true vampire bat which is in the west is found in the west so it feeds on the blood so what happens like you know the leech when it takes blood it will release the anticoagulant right so similarly the bat vampire bat they have that uh, anticoagulant which is 20 times which has 20 times more affinity in dissolving blood than the another and that i have seen in some paper that it can be used as a in uh, treating the her strokes and all other than that, nothing nothing has been proven yet that they are used for the medicine and all. Huh, people may, they have some myths with them, I told you. So they might do all kinds of things. But wherever we go, we outreach people about that. They are not going to cure you anymore. There is nothing mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, so in context of Kashmir, um, yeah. do you know of any roosting sites? for? Bad yeah, we have. We have the roosting sites. You, uh, I think the people who are from Anantanag, there's a place called a Martin. Mm -hmm. We say it Martin or Martin, whatever. So we have a cave there. It's a, I think it's an, it's under Archaeological Survey of India, Bumzu, Bumzu Cave. Mm -hmm. So Bumzu Cave has got a number of bat species in it. And it's a beautiful cave, but the problem again is that people go inside. I have seen people going inside because once I have surveyed there and and I just inquired from the people. They said, yeah, people come here. Because mostly it's all over India. I have seen the people go in the caves for doing all kind of shit. So yeah, for that's, that's, okay. yeah, yeah, that's it. And that that's how. And there's one, most, uh, one more roosting site. I have not been, but my friend has been in the Kalarus. They say, mm -hmm. yesterday also one of my friend was saying that there are these caves and they have got a good number of bats. Okay. Um, and these are the two places, but I am sure, I am sure if Janik is explored for bats, I think we will get a number of species because it has not been explored, number one. There's a lot of demographic changes, I have already told. And one more thing, uh, 
we have uh, the previous records haven't shown any food bats in the in the uh, uh, Kashmir division, but food bats they have been reported from the Jammu division. So which itself says that the diversity is going to be different in both the areas due to the climatic changes. So uh, I think you already answered this question. There is a question by Tawheed Mustaq. I don't know if you can see it on the screen. He's asking, do bats drink blood? No, they don't. They don't. Exactly, they <laughs> don't. Only there is one bat, where, which I told you, which is not found in India, that feeds on blood. And feed, that feeds on the blood of cattle, not the humans. Hmm. OK, so um, we have another viewer. He okay. has asked, uh, I'll just show it on the screen, but he's asked that there is a myth that uh, that, bats, that bats excrete from their mouth. Is it true? No, no, no. No, it's not true. They are hanging upside down. I told you that is their advantage. That is, they have evolved like that. They don't. When they want to. Uh, defecate or something, they will turn upside down. Means they will come into the normal position for defecating without creating mess on their uh, fur and uh, mouth. They don't mm -hmm. defecate for the mouth. Of course, they are. They live in uh, very yeah. long. I mean, they live in a closed uh, societies. So societies. They also have to take care of them, their hygiene and themselves. Yeah, yeah. They 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 take care of hygiene. Even when I have seen the bats, like if it is if it is winter is coming, you will see all the bats. They will come together. They will they will sit together. They will make a roost like a rosette. Okay, and that's how they are maintaining the temperature. Hmm. And and when it is summer, they will go around. They will they will do fanning. Means they will just like we have a fan. They will do fanning with their wings to moderate the temperature. Yeah, to moderate the temperature. Oh, that's pretty interesting. Um, so when is the best time for bat watching? I mean, what time of the day and what season, particularly in Kashmir? See, particularly in Kashmir, it's like evenings you should see, you should look for bats. Means you will find bats, definitely. You go around these chinar trees. Chinar ka jo ped rata, you should go there. Because what happens, the tree hollows, right? Mm tree hollows there are a lot of bats which dwell in tree hollows mm -hmm. so you can find them there and you can go to the or else you can the early morning early there are few species they also come out early morning because i have seen around my home and if you have a kitchen garden you can go when the flowering season is here when the insects are there you just go and take a look in the evenings after six or something you will mm -hmm. somehow you will find any bat one of the bat flying above and what happens, the, mostly people mis, they misinterpret them as a bats, as I have said, birds, as I have said. Once I was in Karnataka and we were surveying, and there was one person, he said, yeah, we know a roost site somewhere here. And after going through the Baldry Cave, Baldry Mountains for uh, two kilometers, then finally he took me to the swift, swiftlets were there. There was a nest of mm -hmm. swiftlets. So, so that's how the people, so you should, clearly watch the flight of bat and bird is totally different. So how can um, people like you who are researchers and who have been working in this field for quite a long time, how can they be, um, how can they communicate to the local communities regarding uh, their uh, conservation status or- Yeah, that's their... what, see, see Kolar, I, I will tell you one case study, which is from our lab, in, in fact, Madhuyans, I think from the last seven to eight years from the day I joined lab. So I think number of times we have visited the Kola. So basically it is an hill. It's a, uh, because you might know the hills, uh, the boulder hills, like in Southern India, they are huge, like monoliths. So, and they are basically granite hills and the people keep on mining. So once we discovered the roof site, then we find there is a lot of mining going around. So it was not a one day, one day thing. So we thought of what should we do? We we spoke to the forest departments. So at first they won't take care, okay? They will take it lightly. So then we went to the locals. We involved the local people. We involved the local people from that village and we made them understand 
about all these things, ecosystem services and other things. And we said, this is the only bat which belongs to Kolar. And its name is Kolar Leaf Nose Bat. And please, if you are not going to stop it, this will go. And they were like, they were kind of, so people have some sentiments also with them, with the region. And then the forest department came into action. We, uh, we did a lot of outreach programs in the schools, in the colleges, everywhere. So that in the press, in the media, and a lot of people came to know about this. And that's how, means uh, today, as of now, it is protected by the Karnataka Forest Department and they're, they're going to soon convert it into a bad century. They have already taken the land from the revenue, revenue department because it's under revenue department. And now there is no activity of mine. Similar is what I feel is in the coming time. I'm thinking of because Bumzu again, it is like, the cave is it's a very nice cave if you go inside it's a very nice cave and it has a means the, there are a lot of bats and we have a good ro roost of myotis longibus and the name itself is kashmir cave bat so it is endemic to kashmir it is endemic to that side so uh, let's see we can do something like that there that's pretty interesting actually to know um so you talked about uh, uh, guidebook on uh, the key to key to bats of south asia yeah yeah so how much of it uh, covers the bats of j and k as to say so whatever has been reported till now it will be there they cover almost all of all of them okay that's interesting it's a very good book I means for big for if you start uh, handling a bat and then ident start to identify it it's a very good book hmm. and in addition to it i told you that there's one more book you should keep that with you also but this is the this is the kind of the key is itself means it will tell you step by step rather than going into the details of each and everything hmm. okay so uh, we are running short of time <clears throat> Thanks a lot for your uh, comments on the questions. And um, I, as I said, it was a very informative talk. And first of all, thank you for accepting the invitation for this talk. It was really nice to have you here. Um, do you wish to say something? Nothing. I just, uh, I just want to say that more people from Kashmir, I know people the Kashmiri people, they are quite intelligent and they are good in their means in science and each and every field, every domain. So I I just request the people that more people should come in, more people should involve in this kind of research. So I know people uh, doing, there's, there's a lot of work going in wildlife, means they but they work on these charismatic mammals, right? So, but bats are again, they are neglected. And that's the reason from the last 20 to 30 years, we don't have any solid records from the Jammu and Kashmir. So I think a lot of people, the youth, the younger generation, they should come and they should they should study bats because they they are the part of the ecosystem. And I have told you about the ecosystem services and all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tahir. Okay, uh, Tarek. Uh, okay. We will sign off from this live broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.